Hi, Titus Murray here from Southern Highland Structural Geology. Um, this is a talk that I gave this week um, at a force seminar on um, fault compartments. Force is a group um, or a research um, outreach from Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. Uh, so we'll just go through the slides I, I presented um, last night. It was about nine o'clock in the evening my time. So talk is about finding oil and gas using stochastic juxtaposition analysis. So this is stuff I worked on, or started working on in the late um, 1990s and early 2000s. So it's quite some time ago now. And um, uh, it was when I was working at Midland Valley. Um, and as you can see, I was a lot skinnier and had a little bit more hair, but not much more hair. Um, this is the, the crew outside Park Circus with Alan and a whole bunch of us there. Um, and I first used the ideas on a project uh, with Enterprise Oil um, when they had an office in Stavanger with Cloudy Gorjana having a look at um, the West Cable prospect at that stage, which finally got drilled recently. Anyway, so these ideas have been bubbling away for quite a while now. So the, the key thing that we're thinking about is that these uh, we've got complex models don't solve uncertain problems. There's a huge amount of uncertainty amongst the geology. We're trying to work on how we can use um, better handling of that uncertainty to produce simpler models to deal with it, uh, not layering on complexity for the, for the hope, hope of solving it. Think about trapping hydrocarbons over charged geologic timescales. In all our studies, we're using open file data, so you can check our statements. If you have problems finding the data, let us know, and we'll, we, we can package up and send through to you. You know, really, science progresses because we break ideas, um, and we can only make these observations because we stand on the shoulders of giants, fundamentally. Um, so that's how science works. You know, put forward an idea and see if you break it. And so, it's, it, none of this is meant to be to me, be mean or any way. It's just um, how how we we progress science. So the idea of uh, stochastic fault analysis um, is that we um, are driving it with a displacement profile from a key reference horizon. So we're taking the upthrown side, the foot wall, um, we're taking the downthrown side, the hang wall of a normal fault. Um, we're, we're looking at the separation between these to get our displacement profile. And that green is our, is our observed displacement profile. And then what I've got sitting on top of that is a theoretical displacement profile, which is a second order polynomial, which basically drives this. The parameters to, to run that polynomial are basically the length, the maximum throw, and the symmetry of the system. And that's, that gives us a way to do a Monte Carlo simulation of the geometry of the displacement field. The foot wall gives us the geometry. We deal with the stratigraphy by um, dividing up into reservoir and seal pairs. So, if, so defining those as a set of thicknesses, and for the SGR calculation, a V shale. And for each of these seal reservoir pairs, we've then got um, potentially we've got thief zones sitting in there uh, to to separate up our seals um, to act as a as a potential thief for hydrocarbons. Each of our traps um, then is a fault block by fault block analysis. Um, within each fault block, we've got a spill point and a crest uh, on the reference horizon, and we then have um, the fault geometry and there are geometric constraints the stratigraphy then lays with that and allows us to isopack up and down our spill points and crests um, and then the other parameter we have in here is hydrocarbon density and that density is used in the um, cross fault pressure difference uh, equations uh, we use the yielding original yielding equations uh, to look at um, how SGR works or what any of the membrane seals effectively so in the in the process we go through fault block by fault block and we generate 10,000 realizations of all the parameters build our 10,000 hour maps spill points and crests and then look realization by realization saying is it fault A is it fault B or is it fill to spill and for each of those realizations we then say well look it's fault A this gets a hydrocarbon water contact at 3,000 meters in realization 2 it's fault B and that gets us a, real, a spill point a leak point at minus 2700 meters and, and we go through point by point going through picking up each of those leak points that then gets us a distribution of hydrocarbon water contacts and that's where we'd stop if we were just doing an exploration um, case a lot of these we're actually going to be looking at known accumulation so it's a hind casting in which case at each realization we compare the modeled hydrocarbon water contact with the observed hydrocarbon water contact and that gets us our error 
and you'll see me talking about error right the way through this. Just to give an example, this is the Mako field in Indonesia. Um, there is another YouTube out uh, on our channel that can give you an idea about how it works. We've got a gas water contact at 393. It's not filled to spill. Uh, we've got a, a reservoir sec. Uh, we've got a we've got ourselves a reservoir uh, with a seal and a thief zone. So we're having a look at whether the fault is enough to juxtapose this and lose the hydrocarbons through the thief zone, or are we leaking it through the top seal given it's so so shallow? So when we do the uh, uh, fault risk analysis, what we see is our observed hydrocarbon water contact in here, and this is the uh, modeled hydrocarbon water contact. Now, the error is pretty small. We've got a 4.6 meters um, mean error um, with a standard deviation of 2.8 meters. So that means that in each of our realizations, this leak point in here is very close to the observed hydrocarbon water contact. That uh, gives us confidence that we've actually got things right. So we've got lots of these we've been through. Um, Bill and I have published a paper in the uh, JELSOC um, special publication on faults. It's an open access. You can get it from ResearchGate. And in there's this diagram, and it shows for a set of um, cases where the um, leak point is <coughs> um, and with a standard deviation. And the blue are the um, juxtaposition cases, and then sitting over in red here are the SGR cases. And these SGR cases, you can see, always over-predict. They have a much larger error and um, much wider standard deviation. So in our view of this, the SGR really isn't adding anything to the uh, exploration case. The other thing that's uh, important to recognize is the SGR will generally, because it's over-predicting that column height, it has problems in exploration cases. And again, this is um, a case study that we've got on YouTube, the Ironbark Prospect in Northwestern Australia. Um, we know about the field, uh, that the well was drilled in here um, late 2020. Um, uh, was they were drilling for three or four months uh, it was the deepest well drilled in Australia um, as of today um, and we know something about it because Brigadier 1 was drilled in here and that and from that we know we've got the TR30 sand and so the key thing is does this TR30 sand juxtapose any potential reservoirs deeper in the section and they chase the deeper sections from Gorgon the way across in a big regional section to suggest deeper in the in the in the Delta uh, in the Mungaroo Delta there would be some sand now, not a lot has been said by the partners, so we don't know what's happened here, but we do know the well was plugged in and abandoned as being dry with no um, uh, no hydrocar hydrocarbons observed. We did an analysis pre-drill. The pre-drill analysis, we ha saw this TR30 sand just dropping down and, and, and hitting each of these um, of the uh, reservoirs, potential reservoirs. And we've got little skinny columns, you know, 62 meters, 19 meters, and 37 meters, with 70 to 50 percent chance of it happening. So that was a lot smaller than the you know, multi TCF they were looking for, and the, the wells drilled off the crest some hundred meters, so wouldn't actually see any of these, and, and thus potentially is why it's dry. If we used shale gouge ratio, we would have seen much larger columns, 290, 270 meters, um, would have been the sorts of things we were seeing. Um, and unfortunately, that wasn't the case. So this is where we can use uh, this fault risk methodology pre-drill. We need to think a little bit about how we're doing geology in general. And there's a, a whole bunch of work that Claire Bond at Aberdeen Uni has been doing about heuristics and uncertainty. It's really worth going and having a look at her canon of work. Um, and a heuristic fundamentally is a, a quick thinking tool. It's the thing that it's the, oh, there's the, there's the tiger, I need to run away. It's not working out what you're going to do or why why you've got in front of the tiger. And that heuristic, you know, for us as geologists, we think of a hammer as, you know, that's our iconic tool. That's the first thing you do is hit it, you know. Don't think, look, you know. Um, well, it isn't always the case that we need a hammer. I, I surround them in my office with a whole bunch of IKEA um, bookshelves. And, yeah, I could put them together with a hammer, but it wouldn't really, you know, it would go together quickly. Uh, but they wouldn't last very well in it, and they wouldn't be particularly good quality. So instead, I use an Allen key and a set of instructions. Now, you know, one of these bookshelves I had to put together three times because I didn't follow the instructions the first time or the second time properly. And you know, and the Allen key really is what we need uh, in that case. And that's a that's a slow thinking tool. It's not the quick hit, bing, bing. You know, get it all done. Now. 
going back and thinking about Ironbark, um, Alexei Melikov at um, Golden at the Colorado School of Mines um, included it in part of a data elicitation he did in LinkedIn. And he had about 200 and something people have a look at a range of high profile wells to be drilled. Um, and most of the people who responded to his, his survey thought there was a 75% chance of success of, of this well. Um, um, you know, prolific basin, no problem with top seal. There should be loads of reservoir there. But I wonder how many of them actually did an Allen map. The data was available in the in the investor pack. In fact, the information he sent out, you know, used that investor pack. You know, so how many of these people were just assuming um, by using a triangle plot or something similar that, you know, that's what they would be expecting to get. And then we'd see a really good sealing system. So is the triangle plot our our heuristic quick thinking tool that's that's leading us astray and i think to a large extent it is um we've forgotten how to do the basics of making good maps making good allen maps doing good sequence stratigraphy it's a lot um th this tool i think is, is a real worry part of the hassle we've got with this is that across science there is a, a replication crisis it's not just geology uh, but in particular, I think the fault seal aspect of geology has really got a problem here. Uh, Bill and I um, published a paper um, in the special publication, and it was a tough one to get through because we were critical of the, the dominant paradigm just now of shale gouge ratio. And so we had a look at what case studies were being put in other papers. Um, and we went back to look at the APG bulletin and saw... Um, what papers have been published since Alan Seminal paper 89 um, that had the, the keyword fault seal in there? And there were 92 papers there. Now, 15 of them outcrop studies, and you know I love outcrop studies. This is a, a bit of Miri behind me, and I've got a number of projects here in the Southern Highlands and the coal fields here, which we're looking at faults, faults in outcrop, and it's valuable, really valuable stuff. If you then look at the um, the rest of the studies that are out there, there were 77 with incomplete data sets. <clears throat> so fundamentally we had 14 structural maps, 13 have independently observed hydrocarbon water contacts, and 12 have stratigraphic information. And they're the three bits of information we need. Now, I did pull out a couple of studies. So Russell Davies um, has a really nice study in there, um, I think about Eugene Island, but it's got excess pressure in there. And so it would be, and that concept has only come in after the paper was published. So it would be inappropriate to put that in in this in there um so you know we really can't replicate much of it in fact there were only two papers that we could replicate one was james et al which is um the exxon mobile paper about them um stochastic fault seal analysis in which they say well sgr isn't a useful tool and membrane seal isn't a useful tool uh, and the other one is um, the Brincat um, CSIRO paper, um, where the structure is actually pretty much filled to spill anyway. So there wasn't a lot we could do there. So, you know, two out of that isn't isn't a good score. We we need to up this. We need more decent case studies which can be replicated. So it was really good that um, Pete Breton and the guys at Badley's put together a paper uh, for the Gelsock Special Publication, um, or the Hangwall Knowledge ba Database. Hanging Wall Trap Knowledge Database. And in that, they had um, a good map of the Osseberg field in Norway. Before we have a look at the Osseberg field, this is another one of the cognitive bias that I'm really quite liking thinking about, it was just this Dunning-Kruger effect. And the idea of this is that as people get a little bit of skill, they tend to overestimate their, their, um, their competence. And the more you do, you know, you get to a point where you, you actually you, know, you start to doubt yourself because you've done so many. And in terms of traps, you know, you start out in here, and then the classic one, the classic example would be um, a kid at high school is pretty good at chess, can beat all his friends in the class, can beat everyone in the school, goes to the you know local interschool tournament, and um, is is soundly beaten by everyone um you know if you're in a small group and you and you think you're you you're the best of the group you tend to have a high opinion of yourself and it, and it takes a while to get through that so we get this high confidence you know, early on we're learning we're learning and, and, and as the more and more we learn the better we think we're getting and you know at around 10 traps i thought i was pretty good uh, i thought i had a pretty good understanding about what needed to be done 
And then I started doing this hind casting and checking what I was doing, and I immediately dropped down called this valley of despair with a hundred traps. You know, I'd spent a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, replicating all the potential algorithms out there: Coulomb failure criteria, shell gauge ratio, uh, top seal failure. Yeah, and it wasn't working. And now I've got myself to about a thousand traps in now, which I've analysed, and. I keep working on it almost on a monthly, sorry, a weekly, almost monthly basis. Um, and, you know, I think once I get to about 5,000 traps, I think I'll be actually in a state where I actually know something. Because, you know, you actually need to see a lot and you need to you need to fail at these things. So, you know, that, that's the way we're looking at these stuff is, well, you know, when something doesn't make sense, not just reaching for a complicated algorithm, but actually try and work out what's going on. So that's that's the attitude that Bill and I took when we had a look at this Osseberg field. So I went through, uh, we got the map. Now this map I'd seen sort of in snippets on face oh, on in Google um, images, but it was locked up in a grey literature and Norwegian Petroleum Directorate report, which I couldn't get from the library. Um, anyway, so Pete eventually went through and published it, and it was great. So I went through and digitized this this fault polygon. This is the key fault here. We've got a foot wall well they refer to and the hang wall well in here. And you know the and they've got different fluid contacts on either side. Digitize the fault. <clears throat> Here's my displacement profile. And look, I'm seeing two distinct displacements. And I think, okay, you know, Tom Manzocchi talks a lot about um, you know, relay ramps in the, in this conference. And you know, this is my classic relay ramp. And my relay ramp in here, it's a change in strike. Yeah, that's that's what it should be. Well, when I had a look at it in detail then and, and ran it through fault risk, I couldn't get a good result. I just, it, it wasn't making sense. So I was talking to Bill and I was saying, okay, what's wrong? And so we, we got hold of the NPD and they sent us across the wireline logs. So there's the 13 well, which is drilled on the foot wall, nice set of logs, and then the 14 well on in the hang wall. What Bill's done is he has referenced these on something called the hot shale which is a semi-regional um, marker in the Brent group. So this is the Brent through in here. Um, and it gives us a way to look at things stratigraphically. So the first thing we saw that was in the 13 well, the first well that was drilled, that we had good reservoir sitting up high um, and that we didn't have the good reservoir on, on the 14 well. Um, the reason we know that is these yellow areas are where Hydro, the operator at the time, perforated and tested. And then it was this upper section that worked well in the 14 well. And then it was this deeper section down in here in the 14 well that perforated and, and flowed. So, you know, we, we could see that there's a difference there immediately. And I started thinking, well, you know, these aren't that far away. This looks as though there's a stratigraphic variation in here. Now, the other hassle we saw was that the map didn't tie the wells. The map actually missed ties by about 40 meters. And that's a real problem. That means then that actually this DST up here is above the map and these ones are considered below the map. So the map isn't of the top of the reservoir and that was part of the reason why I was having problems. You know, if you want to do any fault analysis, you want to do any trap analysis, you need to have a map that ties. Now, in Pete's reply to us through the JOLSOC, they said, well, look, it was a representative map. But still, nonetheless, it, it's important that you produce maps that tie and you describe how they tie. Otherwise, you're going to get twisted off. And this stratigraphic model immediately sprang to mind. Now, this is the work of Loseth, from, from Loseth's uh, thesis and papers. Um, and, it, and they weren't the first person to talk, talk about this, this Brent Delta as being a set of uh, programming, programming Delta with the Tarbot sands being a, a set of sands sitting in a depositional environment on the Brent Delta. So it's not just one sand, it's a whole set of sands. And when you tie that together, you see that... Um, uh, the 14 well is actually part of Loseth's work and that this um, uh, good area of flow is actually a channel mouth channel mouth or channel mouth bar facies. And up in here, we're probably much more um, a shore face facies and, and, and we're not seeing good shore face development in here in the 14. So stratigraphically, these are different systems. It's not a sheet sand. So we sat there and thought about, okay, well, we better go and check what the pressure data is doing. And and this this is from Graham Yielding's original 2007, uh, 1997 paper, and it's the foundation of the cross-fault pressure difference work that he did. And unfortunately, when they published the map, uh, sorry, and published the work, um, it was 
redacted or anonymized, so we don't know what the depth of any of these things were. Now, because we have the NPD data, we can work backwards from this. And so they've got the 13 well in the foot wall with a nice um, um, oil, a water, oil, gas gradient, and then we've got a hang wall um, uh, 14 well. And from that, using this area in here, they cross plot um, to get the cross fault pressure difference. Well, we start to dig, Bill, you know, loves sweating data and there's good geomechanics background. He starts looking at things. And yeah, sure enough, 13 looks pretty good. Pressure data's looking pretty good. But immediately saw, hey, this stuff, that's hydrostatic. This stuff is actually overpressured. And as soon as I see something that's overpressured, I start thinking, well, I need to have confined aquifers here. I need to have pretty well confined aquifers because I can't lose water out of my aquifer to pressure equilibrate back to hydrostatic. So that's immediately going, oh, I've got something interesting going on in here. Now, the hang wall, there's a lot more scatter. There's a lot of scatter in here. Um, and it's not looking that similar to, to the, the, the published um, pressure plot. The other thing is, we went and plotted in the failed tests. In 13 well, there were very few failed tests. In the 14 well, there were lots of failed tests. Now, these are multiple runs. Uh, this run in particular, out of 14... Um, tests, only one actually came up with a val valid pressure. That means that they test multiple places in here that are non-reservoir. Uh, so we've got a lot more non-reservoir in the 14 well compared to the 13 well. Again, this is making me think stratigraphic. So we don't really have good gas support for this gas gradient. We've really only got this one point. And you know, we could well have a water gradient sitting in here with little bits of gas, and they tested gas, but these could be sets of individual gas uh, systems sitting there, stacked in in a bunch of little channels. Um, so we need a lot more information, but one thing's for certain, this is not one reservoir. This is a set of reservoirs. And the waha moment, where I went, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Bill went and plotted up the water gradient for seven, eight, and ten wells, and these are the wells further to the east, and they plot on yet another um, deeper, uh, sorry, higher pressure water line. This is another set of overpressured aquifers. Really hard to get such a large number of them being overpressured unless they are um, separate aquifers, you know, trapped in the shale, not dewatering. This isn't one aquifer, these are across multiple sands, and this is really saying to me, well, this Brent Delta is a stack of separate systems. It's not a set of sheet sands. So we come back to the AFPD, the claim 9.5 bar pressure. Well, is that real? Because it's based on one one point here, and we probably it looks like we've got water against water here, or maybe gas against, but it's it's looking pretty weak on that front. And with one point there, you know, it's not looking good. When we have a look at the AFPD initial calculation, I th this all this area has to be thought of as being quite suspect because it's all based on one point and we've got a great big hole in between. So when we come to the foundation of this, a lot of these top high pressures, I don't know that can be, can be supported. And I, for me, it throws a big question mark on the whole AFPD calculation um, for that this forms the basis of. So having worked out that the map didn't tie, we went back and looked at um, how the BCU uh, base Cretaceous Unconformity worked with this. And, and Pete um, has, has done a good, good job here producing cross-section that shows what's going on in terms of the geology and that the foot wall is slightly eroded. And what we've got here uh, across the, the the area, we've got some areas where we've got erosion and it's completely a angular unconformity. And we've got other areas where it's faulted out. And, and in this area, we've got a faulted unconformity. So we've got faulting, erosion, and then reactivation. So that means then we need to think about what erosion's happened on the Allen map. So... This is a game I've played a lot with um, in Lithotech in the past, a um, good um, balancing restoration tool. Um, and what I've done is I've put yieldings 99.7 cross-section in there. Now, 
again, this was had redacted depths, but because we've now got the data from the NPD, uh, we know which wells are in there, um, and we could we could effectively work backwards and find out what's going on. So took um, the Allen map, uh, <clears throat> went through and, and separated out my hang wall. So I'm working now on a hang wall and a foot wall. And so I can work on both of those and I can go through and unfold the whole system. So this is the unfolded hang wall and foot wall. Um, so I've removed the folding in the foot wall and I've still got displacement in the hang wall. Uh, and from that, I can go through and fix up the eroded section in my um, foot wall. And there's my unfolded hang wall as well. So I've effectively removed now the fault displacement. And that allows me then to come up with this restored Allen map. And this is something that it's really important to recognize. In our code in fault risk, we've written the mathematics so that each one of our Allen maps will balance. Each one of our Allen maps is geologically feasible, plausible. Doesn't mean it's right, but at least we know they're not wrong. And what we can see here is that we're presented with saying, oh, well, look, this is just one simple stratigraphy. Well, it isn't one simple stratigraphy. This is actually a growth fault, and there's a substantial amount of growth. It matches fairly well at the top of the Brent. Now that I've fixed this up and the, and the next, the next the couple, the first couple of sands at the top of the Brent, as we get deeper, we've got a substantial amount of growth. Now, it's not talked about in the papers, um, but yeah, it's fundamental if we're going to try and do an across fault pressure difference calculation to accommodate that growth. Um, yeah, so it's an emission, and it's an I think it's an important emission that needs to be actually dealt with. So we can go through and reconstruct our oh, I've gone through and reconstructed our Allen map, and you can see this was where I was worried that I had um you know a relay ramp, and you know, and that would be where this is where I'm saying, hey, you know, Tom's right, I've got a relay ramp in there. Well, yeah, it actually isn't a relay ramp. What what I've done is I've filled in this area in here, and that's this this revised displacement profile now. And you can see I've now got a sensible displacement profile. So if I run that in and do the um, the hind casting and, and check what's going on, you can see that my hydrocarbon water contact, observed hydrocarbon water contact, is now substantially shallower than the leak point. So I've changed my geometry quite a bit by just putting that erosion in, and, and because that that brain geometry would be there. It's just the, the top of it's been eroded, and that then drives the rest of the Allen map. So what it's saying is that um, this here is not actually controlled by that fault. So we can't do an AFPD calculation. A, it's stratigraphic. B, it's not controlled by this fault. It's controlled by something else. Is it something stratigraphic over here? Is it the fault in here? We know we've got excess pressure. We would need to go through and do a lot more work to actually work out what's going on. But that would be worth it because you know, it could open up a new trap type. So if we have a look at then the northern well, I'm just going to stop calling it the hang wall because it's not the hang wall. In fact, this northern well is actually, there's a little fault in here. Um, and the key thing with this is that the reference horizon, this map, is actually 70 metres above the, the zones that were tested by the DST. That's a lot. And once I put that in there, this little fault in here, well, we're actually in the foot wall of, the, of a fault. And that fault there is actually has, you know, is that this is the observed oil water contact. This fault actually serves to separate the field, uh, separate the accumulation. It isn't controlling it. Again, the observed hydrocarbon water contact is substantially shallower than the um, the juxtaposition. It's something else in here that's going on. Now we're right on the edge. We're pushing the edge of the data here. We've only got one map. We've got two wells. You know. We can see that it's a sediment. It's not a sheet sand system. We know that from um, looking at the stratigraphic modelling. We can see from the pressure data it's not a sheet sand system. Now we're pushing it pretty hard by looking at this, but if you have a map that doesn't tie, it's really hard to work out whether you got seal or not. So again, I would call this as not being controlled by either of those faults, and it's certainly not the hanging wall for the for this block. Um, there, you know, I think it's really unlikely there are hydrocarbons here. Um, so it's one of those ones. We need better maps. We need better models. Um, it'd be great if um, somebody actually found the right models and and could break this. You know, there, there. I'm sure there are elements of what we've just been through here, which we've made mistakes because we've got so little data. But by pulling it to pieces, we can see we can't replicate it. 
So to give you another example, this is one again, this is the problem with the replication. This is some, um, again, from uh, one of Yielding's papers on the Gulfax, and this is about the Gulfax field. This is the problem with replication. We've got a map <clears throat> and it shows us fault blocks and it shows us the, the accumulation that they're going to have, that he's having a look at in here. This is a very generic gen Brent stratigraphy. This is not the stratigraphy for the Gulfax field. This is actually taken from uh, a generic paper about the sequence stratigraphy of the Brent Brent region. Um, and this is the situation. We've got a uh, foot wall in the, the southwestern compartment in the Brent has an accumulation. And then we've got an, another accumulation in the dart underneath. And then the hang wall Brent, we've got another accumulation. So we've got three accumulations. So this is a great example. And I sat there and thought, oh, it'd be great. Now, how can I work it out? Well, the great thing is that, you know, and thanks to Russell and the guys at Slumberger, um, they went through um, and they, they use the Gulfax model as their de demo data set. And um, we can take that fault. We can look at the, compart the segmentation in the fault. And you can see it's got multiple segments in here. And we can go and do a fault, um, fault risk calculation and compare it to these observed hydrocarbon water contacts. What's interesting with this is we're just taking a... The model it may not be the model that that was used by Badley's in the original paper, or um, but it, it's still a model um, of the same field, and we're just using the average stratigraphy thicknesses and average V shales for across the whole field. So it's a real bulking up, and so the errors on this are quite big. They're not too bad for my tarbot. I'm getting 18 meters off. If you use SGR, I'd be 130 meters off. For the Cook underneath, I've got 15 meter error. If I was using SGR, I'd be 20, um, I'd be 22 meters off. The tarbot hanging wall on this side, with juxtaposition, I'm 54 meters out. Now I'm immediately wanting to know, well, what's going on stratigraphically in here? But if I use SGR, I'm 61 meters out, and I've got a wider standard deviation on this. So even though we haven't got a good number, it's better than the SGR. Unfortunately, these wells are still locked up as um as being uh production wells and at some stage we'll we'll be able to get hold of them but not just now so in this case we have been able to replicate it but we've been able to replicate it by coming around the back so in conclusions yeah if juxtaposition works why use sgr sgr any of the membrane seal algorithms are going to increase the seal capacity and I continually get asked well Titus you don't like SGR how about clay smear potential or how about cataclasis well we've written the cataclasis tools in we had to go to the clay smear potential and just and at that stage then realized that this was just making things worse juxtaposition is your, your fundamental and if juxtaposition is working anything else is going to take you away from that it's not going to get you closer to uh, f the right fluid contact we're already getting mean 15 meter error. And when we have a look at outcrop, we can regularly see that we've got thick fault rocks right next to no fault rock with fractures running across it. Have a look at these gigapans that I've got up on there. They're great. So if juxtaposition works, why use SGR? The key controls on fluid contacts in the cases we've seen, and we haven't seen all of them. We've only done a thousand, you know, I need to do 10,000 or 50,000 to really say it. I'm not saying it isn't happening there, but you know the key controls are displacement, the stratigraphic seal thickness. Just do a good job. Don't get twisted off on esoteric algorithms. Just do a good job. Make a good map. Make sure it ties with the wells and do good sequence stratigraphy. It's not hard. We know how to do it. And then make good Allen maps, you know, the faults have uncertainty and the complexity, and it's vital that we use a stochastic technique. And that stochastic technique is not there to make it more complicated, but it's to understand the uncertainty. Uncertainty in your picking, uncertainty in your bias, and uncertainty in the data. Now, philosophically, and this is where we're sitting, I know a lot of talks at this seminar are about CO2, um, and it's really important to say what's going on here. So uh, there's an oil company, um, you know, you can look at their share price and you can see at the end of it, massive drop, a dry well. 
So if we go and use shell gauge ratio and we make the prospect look good and we get it drilled, that's great. That's great for you and me. But then when it's dry, that's between you and me and the shareholders. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, it could have been six TCF and we had twenty percent chance of success. That's sort of how it rolls. And you know, that uncertainty and 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 the size of the prize on the back end of it works well for, for oil and gas. When we start working in groundwater, CCS, and rad waste, I don't think we can actually take those, those, we can work in that sort of method. These are regulatory environments. People are having to go through planning permission and they're actually having to do proper environmental impact statements, publishing data and publishing their assumptions um, in there. And I think using an algorithm that we can't replicate is problematic. Yeah, so, so then the other one is, well, now, government might be okay with that. I, I guess the one that I've seen, and Bill and I have been working a lot on this groundwater and coal and coal seam gas, is if we lose the respect of the people because of our poor science, we've got a real problem. Now, this is uh, close to my in-laws, um, up on the Liverpool Plains, uh, north of uh, where I live. Uh, um, and these people really don't want coal seam gas. They don't trust the coal seam gas industry. Now, as geoscientists, as scientists, we're going to have to get people to trust us. We're going to have to get people to trust us because we're going to have to dispose of carbon dioxide. We're going to have to dispose of rad waste. We're going to have to dispose of toxic waste. And we're going to have to manage our groundwater. So having a, a proper algorithm in there is really, really important. So please, if you do one thing, please use more Allen keys. Oh, Allen maps. Yeah, yeah, Allen Maps. Allen Maps need to be nice and simple, beautifully crafted, not there to bamboozle anyone. They are a little bit difficult to, to read, but please, proper Allen Maps with scales that we can actually put in space and show there and annotate what you're trying to say. The more we see them and the less we bamboozle our co-workers, the better. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, you know, if you've got any questions, flick them through, leave them a comment um, down below, um, and Bill and I can reply to them. And you know, to a large extent, thanks to our customers over the last 20 years who funded a lot of projects and, and development. And um, let's hope that we can get together to these scientific conferences more often together and, and also get back into the field looking at fantastic faults like this one in Miri. Anyway, I'll see you soon.